All right, welcome to our Welty at Home book club. I'm Lauren Rhodes. I'm the director here at the Eudora Welty House and Garden here in Jackson, Mississippi. And this is a very special edition of our Welty at Home book club. It's our first author appearance. Um, we're so excited to have Ron Rash here. This virtual book club began last spring in the throes of the pandemic and shelter in place. We started with Welty's novel, Losing Battles, published in 1970, reading it over the course of 10 weeks. Um, since then, we've also read Margaret Walker's Jubilee, uh, Welty's The Golden Apple, and most recently, Ron Rash's In the Valley. Um, and each book we read slowly, um, deliciously, so that we can discuss it in depth. And it's been really wonderful. We've grown um, immensely since we started. We have members from all over the country that are here today. Um, even, at, I think, at least one international member as well. Um, so we are delighted to continue reading books by Welty and books whose authors are connected to Welty in some way. Um, I know you all know and love Suzanne Mars, our fearless leader, but I'm going to reintroduce her today since we're recording this call. Suzanne is, uh, was a friend of Eudora Welty's and the author of Eudora Welty, a biography, um, along with many other scholarly articles and books about Eudora Welty. She is the Eudora Welty Foundation Scholar in Residence and a professor emerita at Millsaps College. So I'm going to turn it over to Suzanne who will introduce Ron Rash. Um, let me first just go over a couple reminders uh, if you can keep yourselves muted during the call while we're talking until you ask a question, you can unmute yourself. And just a reminder, if you need to raise your hand or if you'd like to give any of those fun clapping or excited emoji reactions, you can just click the reactions button at the bottom of the tab and feel free to uh, write your comments in the chat as well. All right, Suzanne. All right, well, uh... I don't know if Ron reads his reviews or not, but if he has, he, uh, he knows that Janet Maslin of the New York Times Book Review has called him one of the great American authors at work today. And I want to say that those of us in the Eudora Welty Virtual Book Club agree with that assessment. Uh, we've spent the past six Mondays discussing In the Valley, its narrative strategies, its compelling characters, its powerful and complexly developed themes. And now all of us are delighted that we have a chance to talk with you, Ron, the author himself, uh, about, uh, about this book, a wonderful book. So thank you for joining our Zoom session. I'm going to start with a couple of general questions, and then I'll turn it over to members of the club. I'll call on you with submitted questions in advance, and then at the end, we'll have uh, some open uh, time for questions. Um, we'll try to finish up right at uh, one o'clock our time, because uh, Ron has to teach. Uh, so we'll give him a time to get away and get to his class. All right, let me uh, start things off by saying that Eudora Welty was a great fan of the short story. From the start of her career, she preferred the short story to other forms. And when she was pressured to write a novel late in the 1940s, she resisted that pressure. Uh, she had published one novel, uh, but she resisted the pressure to turn the connected story she was writing into a novel. And she published uh, a story cycle instead, which was uh, one we've just read called The Golden Apples. Seven stories set over a period of 50 years with characters in one story playing a major role and then the next story may be a minor role, maybe disappearing, uh, but uh, the stories all uh, interlinked. So I'm wondering, Ilhan, you wrote uh, In the Valley, which is set in a North Carolina Valley over a period of about 150 years, if you were thinking of this book as a kind of story cycle, and if so, how you feel the stories are connected and how you decided upon the ordering of the stories? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I First off, just say it's good, great to be doing this. Um, I've learned a lot from your book, Suzanne, so thank you for that. Thank you. And uh, 
but I've also learned a huge amount from Eudora Welty. Uh, she is one of my favorite writers. I, I, I think you, if you have read interviews by me, I think that's one thing that's been, I've always noted uh, her greatness as a writer. Um, but, uh, you know, to get, get to that question, I, I always want my books of stories. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, a CD or, you know, when I was growing up, uh, an album, a record album, you want the uh, sum to be greater than the individual parts. And um, I, when I write a book of stories, I want that to happen. So when I wrote In the Valley, I, I wanted the reader to feel as if uh, he or she has, has gone into this place and had a, a sense you know, a kind of a connectiveness through time, a sense that, that, that a very, I hope almost a feeling of uh, a kind of rhythmic movement through time, even where you might not even be exactly clear where in time you are at the beginning of some of the stories. So I, I kind of wanted, yeah, to, the stories to be linked by a place, but also a sense that I've given you um, a, a deep sense of this place over time, just through these stories. Uh, the one aspect that I didn't have a lot of uh, as much control over as I wish, I probably would have put in the valley in the middle of the book if I could have um, written this book, uh, done this book exactly the way I wanted. But felt like uh, uh, that last story to me uh, about the grandfather. Um, I, I kind of wanted the book to end with that because I began during that Civil War period and then I come back to it, kind of link link that way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I hope, I hope the reader has a sense of uh, that place over time, yeah. That would have given the uh, book a much more positive feel at the end too, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I kind of I, I wanted that, you know, um, I was finish up finishing up the book when we were going through all these, you know, these first three months, months of COVID. And I, I'd like to think, I think one thing literature can do is remind us that people go through very tough situations and yet they also get through them, you know, they survive. And, and I thought that ending to me was the ending that I, I kind of wanted to leave the reader with uh, more than Serena. <laughs> um, let's turn to, uh, a couple more general questions, one from Lynn Evans. Um, I think you just talked about my question a lot. It was uh, talk about what Edor Welty calls a sense of place. Um, yeah. I, I really felt like your characters spring right out of the landscape uh, and that they're very affected by it, both uh, in the sense that they're um, isolated and at the same time, very connected because everybody lives there. Could you maybe talk a little bit more about that? That's interesting. I actually just got a a, an, um, a, a request last week from, uh, of all places, Dubai in, in the Middle East asking me to write about this. So I, I'm re I've got a good answer, I think. I hope I have because I, I've just finished an essay, I mean, a short essay about this, but uh, I'm fascinated with the way landscape affects people psychologically. And what I find interesting about mountains, people who grew up in mountains, and I've gotten letters from different parts of the world that from mountain people that tell me they, they think I've got, got something right about that landscape. And I think two things can happen to people who grow up in a mountain landscape, or at least this is my premise. And a lot of my work work goes in this direction that uh, you can either find the mountains so daunting uh, you know the that uh, that you, it's almost as if your own life feels small and insignificant uh, you're, you're always kind of reminded of uh, of uh, you're, you feel kind of closed in almost claustrophobic and I've, I've dealt with characters who have felt this way uh, uh, in a, a book called The Cove. And, uh, but the other side of that is that it can also be like a very protective sense that the mountains are protecting a person. 
um, that, that you're being sheltered. It's almost womb-like. And um, I, I, so I've sensed that both of those aspects affect people in, in mountains. And so I try to I deal with that. Uh, but yeah, I do. I, for me, it pretty much starts with landscape. And I think when I was a young writer, uh, one of the great lessons that uh, Eudora Welty taught me, but, but also Faulkner, of course, is that uh, your place in the world, wherever it is, there's, there's enough there. Mm -hmm. And also that for me, well, you know, Yodora Welty says, I, I may be, I always get a word of this wrong, but uh, one place comprehended makes other, all other places uh, clear, you know, uh, one place comprehended makes all places. What is that? Do you remember, Suzanne? All is it to lets us understand other places? I can't yeah. remember exactly. Yeah. 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 One place understood help or comprehended makes us understand all other places better. That's, that's it. And I, I, I think that's true. I mean, I think that's why I can read a writer, say, Mo Yan from China. And, and I still, when he writes about his, you know, rural Chinese landscape, I, I can react to that, those characters. Uh, but I see uh, uh, writing in place, I, I, I make the analogy, it's like a farmer drilling for water. If you go deep enough into that place, you're gonna hit, you're gonna hit the universal. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of out of favor among scholars right now, <laughs> or at least some that idea that, you know, of, of literature being able to transcend cultures, but uh, uh, I'm still stubbornly believing in it. Eudora Welty believed that as well. And, uh, and she uh, really hated the regional label. And I'm sure you, yeah. you rebel against that too. I do, Lauren, yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, good. <laughs> Lauren, you have a couple of questions. One, yeah, I think one, this is, one general and one specific, I think. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll start with this. I think it segues nicely. Um, like Welty, you know, she had a, a deep connection to nature. She was a gardener, but also just the natural world of, of Mississippi and beyond um, played a major role in her work. How does your relationship with nature feed your writing and vice versa? Oh, well, it's, it's huge. Um, I mean, I was very fortunate in, in growing up in Western North Carolina that I always lived in rural areas, but um, I spent, when I was a, uh, a child and adolescent, I spent a lot of my summers on my grandmother's farm near Boone, North Carolina. And, uh, you know, all of her other children, you know, children had grown up, my, my grandfather died, and I would be on that farm just her, you know, sometimes weeks at a time. And I, you know, my brother and sister never wanted to go, but I just always loved that. But um, I was, her land bordered the Blue Ridge Parkway. So, you know, there, it was just a, a beautiful, rural area and uh it was kind of like being huck finn i mean she just would let me go and and you know i mean i'd be like 12 years old and i'd be gone you know four six hours and uh I, we had relatives in that general area so if i went off too far one you know in any direction i was going to probably run into somebody i knew but uh what what i did was i just loved being outdoors and it wasn't so much i was studying plants or salamanders or whatever but i was I was just always turning over rocks. Uh, I, you know, I would just kind of think about, you know, what, what the woods smell like at a certain time, you know, things like that. And, uh, and so I've always loved being outdoors. And uh, I, I think it's just a way, uh, just one more thing that, I, I, it's interesting that readers, I think we, we love, even though it's fiction, we love to read about real things. If that, you know, that sounds like a contradiction, but I think you know what I mean. I mean, for instance, if you, uh, you know, read a, read a book, uh, let's see, I don't know, a book about bear, the bear. I mean, you're going to learn something about hunting in that. Uh, that's probably not the best example, but, but a book about somebody who does a job, for instance. So, you know, it's kind of interesting, but uh, my point being that you know the, uh, the the wildlife, the uh, fauna that I that I write about. I think that makes the place more real. 
And, uh, you know, uh, I, I just want to bring the reader, make the, the uh, landscape I write about as real as possible, as real as possible. So I want to make that, you know, that landscape uh, 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 almost as visceral as I can for the reader. Of course, Eudora Welty would say the, exactly the same thing and did in her essay, Place in Fiction, that it's that sense of that credible world that allows you to believe in the story that's being told. If you believe in the world of the story, then yeah. you, you believe in the story itself. And, okay, Lauren, you, oops, go ahead, Ron. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, there, it's interesting because, for instance, when I wrote Serena, I had to write a lot about things I, I did not know anything about. Mm -hmm. Eagle hunt, you know, hunting with an eagle, all those things. And, and uh, I, one thing I've learned is that I will always get something wrong. There will always be a reader to let me know it. Right. <laughs> you do the best you can. You know, you do the best you can. And uh, uh, actually, when I wrote Serena, uh, I, I interviewed one of 12 people in the United States who hunted with an eagle. And uh, so, yeah, but uh, yeah, you try to get it as, as right as you can. Laura? I think we weren't sure if that part was fictional or not, but I'm uh, glad to know that someone actually does hunt with an eagle. It's well, they, the, the guys, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I don't know that anybody did hunt rattlesnakes with an eagle, but uh, I asked him, would it be possible? Would, could, could it, and, and he actually did. I actually found out later that there, is, there was someone in uh, Florida who did hunt with an, a hawk to kill snakes. So... Yeah. Lauren, did you have a second question or shall we move on here? Sure, well, we can move on to the next question, um, which is a very taking us in a very different direction. Um, from, from Harriet, I think, right? Yes, Harriet on. And these are uh, on two of the stories uh, preceding in the valley. Hello, uh, there you go. There you are. Um, so. Ron, this is a question about flight and ransom uh, and about ambiguity in those stories. Uh, Stacy in flight and James Dillard in ransom are two wounded but justice-minded characters uh, who respond to injustice with illegal actions. Uh, can you talk some about how you see them, uh, their causes and actions uh, and their ambiguities? Um, similarities or differences, uh, and maybe two, why you wanted to write about them. Oh, wow. Oh, that's tough. <laughs> it's your job, not mine. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think well, what happens though, is that the, you know, the, the, the characters kind of, uh, you know, I tell my students that even if you don't believe in free will for human beings, you have to for your uh, characters. And my characters sometimes surprise me with their motivations. Um, in flight, for instance, um, I knew that something traumatic had happened to her. And I knew that she was trying to find a way to deal with it. And um, in her own mind, very troubled mind, uh, what she did uh, kind of freed her. I mean, even to the point where at the end, you know, she feels almost ready for some kind of flight. I mean, uh, she's transcended something. Um, and I, that is certainly there. And, and in the other story, and that's interesting, those are the last two stories I did for the book. It's interesting you would bring those two up, uh, because I think they are kind of different from maybe a lot of this, maybe all the stories I've ever done before. They certainly flight. I think, but I, I think one thing I've always been interested in, and this has been true in Serena, One Foot in Eden, almost all my books, is how uh, uh, the law uh, and sometimes standard morality fails us. Uh, you know, the idea of justice. And um, I, I, I think some of that certainly came through in, in, in those two stories. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that would be at least that's a start <laughs> on an answer. I, I, I mean, it's interesting because Becky, uh, um, or, or yeah, the character in, in Flight. Uh, Stacy. Hmm? Stacy. Stacy. Yeah, yeah, my character's brilliant. Uh, she, 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 
I didn't ever quite feel like I got to uh, to the deepest part of her. Uh, I, you know, there's there's it's it's kind of like in real life. You know, we think we know people, but we never really know each other completely. And, and there's still something going on with with Stacy that I can't quite grasp. Uh, but but uh, but I hope it's compelling, whatever it is to the reader. Yeah, I love the story. I have to well, say, thank it's you. A great story. Yeah. I associated Stacy at the end of that story with the with the raven. She feels like the raven, and the oh, raven, yeah. the raven leading uh, the animal to its prey. Uh, uh, Stacy being a part of that predatory thing, but on the other hand, we feel great sympathy for her, this kind of ambiguity there at the end. Yeah, and I, I think that's where I, I think. The stories I love very often are the stories that kind of uh, leave us in those areas where we don't, you know, of ambiguity, I, I, because I think life is like that very often. But, uh, I, you know, I don't want simplifications. And, uh, and I, I kind of like short stories that kind of open out, uh, you know, they kind of enter the, uh, you know, they enter maybe a mystery and then they kind of uh, almost ripple out. And I think... Uh, that's kind of, you know, part of what I, I, I hope my stories do. Yeah, they do. You and your Dora Welty have that quality, I would say. Well, um, I, I, you know, I don't, uh, I, I feel like that is a diminution, one of my favorite terms, uh, <laughs> where you put two things that seem to be equal and, and you know what. <laughs> uh, uh, I always tell, talk, when I talk to my students about diminution, I say that, you know, I went, I used to go to a bar and, and uh, the bar had a sign that said politicians and other drunks not allowed. <laughs> but I'm not sure who, you know, which one, which one is being you know, lowered, you know. <laughs> uh, Susan, you had a question. Susan Shands Jones. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I had a question about long last say we really liked that story and we wondered if you had been to the the pearl Mint, the Peche Merle caves in France and we also talked about the theme of art as redemption and Jake as the professor in that in the valley and how he reminded us of Miss Eckert the piano teacher in June recital oh, that's an interesting analogy but but I like it uh yeah that I think if I had to pick the story that meant the most to me in this collection, it would probably be that one. Oh, wow. That's the story where I just personally went deepest uh, in some mm -hmm. myself mm -hmm. into my obsessions. And one of those obsessions is the cave art. Uh, I'm, I have never been, uh, and, and it's, I, I keep wanting to because I go to France fairly often. My books have done very well in France. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, and you do our wealthies do too. Susanna yeah, and a whole group of French wealthy scholars. Yeah, yeah, they love Southern writers in France. Uh, but uh, that, yeah, that that story. Uh, but I, yeah, as I say, I, I've always been fascinated with that cave art, particularly because you think how old it is, and and yet there's some kind of human impulse there right. to create. And um, I, I plan to go. Uh, I read books on it, uh, but I can remember even as a child, I was probably about 10 years old and I saw a, uh, a photograph of, of, of some of the cave art. And I remember just, it, it had a real hypnotic effect. I mean, there was something there that I think on some level we connect to, even though, you know, some of that art is 35,000 years old. Mm -hmm. But I, I thought, you know, I've always been fast, fascinated with caves and with uh, descents into the underworld. Uh, you know, that traditional uh, mode where the character goes into uh, the underworld to bring back new information. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I love that, the idea of the grail, the quest, uh, all that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, but it, it is about uh, the redemptive power of art. I, I think it is. And, and uh, not in a simplistic way, but I think for me, at least in that story, uh, the sense that Jake has, that he makes the connection with the veteran. Right. Traumatized. And I think there's something shared there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and just that moment for me, which I thought was the moment I felt like I had a story was when 
I realized that he was going to lie down and be able to sleep there. Right. And, you know, at the end of the story, I mean, he's still healing, but right. I do think something has happened that mm -hmm. is good. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, but yeah, that, 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 that's a story that I, yeah, I, I worked hard on. I, I, I probably did 20 drafts on that one. It, to get it right, but uh, I think I finally, you know, got it to where it would work. I hope it did. Yeah. Yes, it was one of our favorites. Yeah, good. I'm glad you liked it too. <laughs> yeah. Lauren, I I think I cut you off. You had one question about the short stories. Did you uh, want to ask that? Yeah, we have. Then, and then maybe we can ask Alec too. I think he had a more general question before we move on to questions right. about in the valley. But this question is about. Um, vengeance and you, you talked a little bit before about moral ambiguity and there's lots of moments in the book where characters take vengeance and you know like Brent burning the dock and I have to admit like those are very satisfying moments for me to read mm -hmm. even though you know they are morally ambig ambiguous and have unintended consequences for these characters is vengeance a theme that you actively think about in your writing or is it just something that a pattern that kind of emerges naturally? Well, yeah, I think it maybe it come, goes back to that, you know, what we were talking or I was talking about earlier about how very often uh, uh, the law or, you know, standard morality, whatever, justice, I guess, tradition, you know, fails people. And I think that's just a compelling uh, theme. Uh, but yeah, that story uh, where, where the dock is burned, uh, to me, the, the heart of that story is the father, mm -hmm. the father's reaction, you know, that his son has done this vengeful act. And I think you sense that uh, there's a real breach at the end of that story. Uh, to me, that, that, that's a very, that is the, 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 the really kind of sad part about that, because I think we do understand his, you know, we are kind of satisfied that he burns down the dock. And we also, I hope, understand why, you know, uh, the young man, uh, he wants, what he wants is, is, is a family. I mean, and I, I, I think uh, maybe Robert Frost set up, uh, what was it? Uh, a momentary stay against confusion. I, I think stories, you know, some they seem to give us that, but then, then, then maybe they don't. But uh, I hope that, uh, yeah, uh, I do. I do deal with that. And uh, certainly, um, I think we see in, in the valley, we certainly see someone, uh, maybe not vengeance there as far as knowing uh, that the law, that not, not, nothing else is going to stop these people. Yeah, yeah. That is like a assassinating Hitler. <laughs> uh, I have to say, I'm, I think that was a great scene. That, that axe work was spectacular in that scene. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I just I wanted that story uh, to kind of feel very old, even though it said in you know about 1930, and I, I kind of I hope a little bit mythic. And I thought, yeah, you know, you you can't have them just shoot somebody. We need we need Axe brought in. <laughs> uh, Alex, you had a question. Yeah, Alex had a one that was a little more general about writing process. Alex. Well, right. I think, uh, Ron, you may have covered this, but uh, if I can think of which question in my mind. Um, Lauren, well, I, I can't think. I, I'll ask a different one, okay? Listen here, Alec, if you want me to remind you what you asked. <laughs> okay, go. You ask. You, um, ask. you asked about, you know, you talked about how his characters are so believable and, you know, the process of how do you learn about history? Do you research or, like Faulkner, do you listen to old folks talk? Do you channel a character when you're, when you're writing about that one? Yeah, all of the above. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother on that farm. And, and one of the great things about that was that I spent a lot of time, not only with her, but with a lot of my older relatives. So I got to hear that vernacular. 
uh, which was a great gift. And, uh, but also the stories and uh, yeah, and, and I do do research very often uh, or I'll read, I love to read history and uh, sometimes I'll come across something and it, it will trigger a story. Uh, so I, I just try to keep myself ready. You know, I always have a pen nearby. And a, but the more I write, the more mysterious the writing is. I don't know where the stories come from. And I, I'm not saying that in a joking way. Uh, I, and I think a lot of writers would agree. I mean, they just kind of announce themselves. And uh, I tend to do probably a lot of my research but for instance, with the belt, I did hear a story. Someone actually told me a story about someone who had uh, saved a child like that during the flood. And I just thought that was such uh, an amazing story. Uh, and then, but then I, you know, I knew that story. I'd heard the story for a few years, but then one day I just realized the character, the grandfather, and once I, I saw him, and I, I did kind of see him, uh, I, I kind of had a sense of what was going to happen. Uh, and I didn't know how. Uh, I just knew that he was going to save that child. And I think that's where probably on some subconscious level, I was already, things were, were working because I, I, I uh, became a grandfather about a year ago. I suspect that you know, uh, and the book's dedicated to my grandson, Colin Trash. And so I think all, you know, those kinds of things, uh, somehow it, it emerges out of that. But um, um, I tend to do more research. Well, I do novels, particularly. I do, a, you know, once I start, I, I, I'll come to something where I might ask myself, well, or when I did In the Valley, uh, ask myself, um, you know, a question like, uh, what kind of car would would uh, this person drive, or uh, where? How would they treat snake bite at this time? Well, I kind of knew that anyway. I mean, what they do is not the way you should. You know, that was the old belief that you're supposed to cut it. But uh, uh, and but, but yeah, I, you know, I just I, it just all kind of comes together, or you hope it does. Well, let's talk a, a, about In the Valley. I think Mary has a question for you about In the Valley. Hi, Ron. I'm Mary. Hey, um, Mary. As I watch it, I did teach American Lit for a long time, and I love how there's so many American themes that you take in In the Valley that come together. And obviously, there's some parallels. You have the flu of 1918 and COVID and then the denuding of the forest. And then we have the, uh, the huge discrepancy in the class, the working class and people with money and the, the you know, negative past that greed puts on the whole community and people getting away with murder, literally. So as you wrote the book, were you aware, consciously aware of these parallels I know that lit good literature, uh, we can always see today in, in stories. But were you consciously aware of this as you wrote? Yes, and I think that's one reason I like to, one reason I write about the past is I think it's a very subversive way to write about the present. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, when I wrote Serena uh, about 12 years ago, I, I was writing about what was happening in the United States right then. Um, uh, and, uh, the same is true with the cove. So I, you know, and, and, but I mean, you, you want it both ways. I, I want the book to have the feel of, of that. It does feel like it's 1930, but at the same time, I, I hope the reader since, it, you know, I, what I would love ideally, I think is that a reader might read 30 or 40 pages and then suddenly realize, no, that he's writing about today. Exactly. Yeah. And so. Yeah. Were yeah, and I think that's that to me is 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 very satisfying because uh, the reason I went back to Serena was I felt 
particularly in the last few years, um, you know, the, the uh, natural national forest and uh, wildlife areas were under siege. Uh, you know, one of the last major uh, salmon fisheries in Alaska. I mean, you know, really some really devastating uh, environmental uh, changes were were being put into place, were, uh, and, you know, and uh, so uh, that really had a lot to do with this book, uh, my writing this book, what was happening right now. But also I'd kind of, you know, Ross was a character I was very interested in when I wrote Serena and I, I felt like he had more to tell me. And, uh, and the other thing was I knew I wasn't going to write a sequel to Serena. That feels too much like Ghostbusters too. But um, I did want to kind of revisit it and I'd never written a novella and I love that form. I guess, would the Ponder Heart be considered a novella? Yes, and the Robber Bridegroom. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, you know, I, I love the Optimus that Walker, really. Yeah. yeah, and so uh, I'd never done one. So this gave me the chance. Uh, and, but I, I kept feeling like draft after draft that it was, you know, it was almost like a caboose onto the end of Serena. And I, I said, I've got to find a way structurally to make this book independent. And then uh, that's when I put the animals, the little segues with the animals. And I felt like that, that did it for me. Yeah, that was when I felt like I had something that was independent of anything else. Yeah. Ron, we have two questions about the character Serena uh, that are related to each other, but I think we'll put both, let two people pose these questions because they come from a little bit of different angles. One is uh, Lynn and the other is Tammy. So Lynn, you have a question about Serena and then Tammy, the character. Okay, I'll be quick. Um, I just, we, I was just fascinated that she was a woman. I mean, why did you do that? <laughs> in, it, in history, it, the characterization she has are so male. So uh, in, the, in the worst way, why did you decide to do it that way? Well, she kind of decided it. Uh, I actually, when that book, I, I knew, I started having a sense I was going to write something about the, you know, the temp, uh, Smoky Mountains Park. And, but one day I was driving, and I just had this image of a woman on horseback. And um, she was very rigid, uh, very confident. I could tell that. And uh, I knew that somebody was looking at her with a mixture of love and fear. And it started there, but um, you know, uh, as I got more and more into it, I, I, th I thought it would be kind of interesting because we don't have a lot of really powerful female villains in American fiction. I mean, ones that have power outside of a family. And I thought, well, you know, that might be kind of interesting, but I do, I hope that I mean, she is masculine in many ways, but uh, but I hope she's also, I mean, uh, in her relationship, which you don't see in, th in this book, but in Serena, that she's also a woman. I mean, she's very sexual and sensual too. So, um, but, um, you know, uh, I, I, I just found her interesting and, uh, uh, and, and kind of fun and fun and kind of frightening to write about. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, she just, you know, she she just came as a woman. It wasn't like I consciously decided that, but later, you know, I started thinking, well, this is this is kind of interesting. And uh, some people have compared her to Lady Macbeth, but I don't think that. I mean, and I did play off Macbeth and Serena, but I, I think she's more uh, Marlovian. Uh, you know, she's Lady Macbeth flinches. Uh, Serena doesn't. And, and did y'all did y'all catch the woman she's talking to at the beginning, uh, the reporter from the yeah. public? When the world and uh, world my will are one. Yeah, but she's uh, the the reporter is Martha Gellhorn. Oh, oh no, I didn't oh. see that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you know anything about Martha Gellhorn, uh, mm -hmm. she was very much like Serena. <laughs> Uh, in the life. I mean, uh, you know, Hemingway was terrified of her, you know. <laughs> uh, Tammy, did you want to build on that question? 
Well, he kind of answered what I was going to ask, which was the idea of was Serena based on anybody in real life? And how does it change that she's a woman? How, how do you think um, your readers have responded to it because she's a woman instead of a man? Well, I, I hope, uh, I, I think they found it interesting. Mm -hmm. Would normally, we, we would expect that kind of role to be, be with a woman. Uh, uh, I've had a couple of funny things happen with her. Um, uh, when the book first came out, I was in Washington doing a book signing and a guy said, I'll buy two hardbacks if you'll sign the second one exactly the way I, uh, I ask you to. <laughs> you know, I just thought, well, I don't know anybody in Washington, so why not? So he had me write it out and uh, he said, this is to, to Marianne, this book is about the only person meaner than you. <laughs> I don't know who Marianne was, but... Uh, um, but I had him sign his name first, and I, I wrote mine down down later. <laughs> but um, and another time, uh, um, um, a minister uh, was giving a sermon near where I live, and she had read the first forty pages of Serena and was talking about strong role models in the Bible, and mentioned Serena as a as a possible role model as well. And uh, then she read the rest of the book and had <laughs> you know kind of change her view on that. Um, but I, you know, I hope. I, I hope that the reader finds her in her own way believable. Uh, I mean, I think there are some, you know, Anne Rand, certainly some elements I would think that would connect to her. Uh, she's very Nietzschean above good and evil. Uh, um, I find her, I just found her interesting and, and I hope my reader does too, yeah. Go ahead, Tammy, you had a question about Ross. I did have a question about Ross and the Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I hope I'm saying it correct, quote that's yeah. at the beginning of the book. Yeah. How do you think Ross connects with that? How would he, or does he personify that? Uh, yeah, let me uh, read. Can you read it to Yeah, because that, because it, yeah, it does. I have it here, Suzanne, do you want me to read it? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. And I do not mean the faith which flees the world, but the one that endures the world and that loves and remains true to the world in spite of all the suffering which it contains for us. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think it, I think it does tie into Ross. I mean, uh, I mean, he is, you know, uh, I think what, one of the most terrifying aspects is that terrible people have terrible power in the world. Hitler, Stalin, Mao, uh, Serena. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and yet uh, I think one thing that's heartening is that there always seems to be somebody who's going to fight it. Um, and Bonhoeffer was certainly one of those people, um, and I think Ross is one of those people. You know, he he will not. Uh, he's he's quite willing uh, to sacrifice himself for another. And for what he thinks is right, and so I think that kind of ties him into that. And uh, and I think he, uh, you know, I, I, I Faulkner once said that he thought most people were a little bit better than their circumstances ought to allow. And I love that quote because I think it's right. I think most people are, but yeah, I think Ross is a. Uh, yeah, I think he is in that he's quite willing to sacrifice himself for what he believes. And and what he believes in ultimately is love. Uh, and uh, he cannot love his family anymore, his own daughters. But uh, to me, it's an act of love toward them that he does this. Thank you. Let me ask one other thing about uh, the character of Serena. Um, I take it from your answer, you're thinking of her as a kind of unique individual, not as any sort of representative figure. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think she certainly uh, can evoke certain strong characters in the past. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Queen Elizabeth once stood on a map of the world. I've always been kind of honed by that image. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that's what you want to do with characters, that you want them uh, not, not just to be types, but you want, you hope that the reader feels like this character, while 
in some ways very similar to other characters is unique. Uh, I mean, I, you know, well, I love, uh, I teach a, a worn path and, and I love Phoenix Jackson because I think Phoenix Jackson, I never think, I mean, she is a type. I mean, she is a, a kind of grail knight going on a quest. I mean, you can see her that way, but she's always Phoenix Jackson first. And, and I think that's what makes memorable characters is that you really, you, you know, you, you recognize that they are types, but then, or, or archetypes even, but they, but they always, there's always this point where you go back to, you believe in them as individuals. Is Serena particularly terrifying for the crew because she is a woman with power because she is unique? Not because she's a woman, but because yeah. she is the woman who has this uh, incredible power. I think so, and but I think there's a, uh, there's a, there's a kind of superstition about her. Uh, you don't see it in in the valley as much. Well, you do. I mean, the, that you know, the, with the uh, uh, the uh, older woman the, who seems to have this supernatural ability. So I think they 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 feel that she has a, a kind of otherworldly power. I mean, in 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 the written in Serena in the novel, mm -hmm. she, when she's pregnant, you know, they talk about her going out and the moon kind of coming onto her belly. I mean, all sorts of you know kind of myths about her, uh, you know, and uh, so uh, yeah. But but I think she's they they understand that she's smarter than they are. She knows timber better. Mm -hmm. And, and they understand that she's, um, she will, you know, she's utterly ruthless uh, and she, uh, she will do what she says. I, you know, I always uh, admired, uh, or not admired, but I always thought Jordan Baker was an interesting character in The Great Gatsby because whatever else she is, she's not hypocritical. <laughs> she, she says, you know, that it takes two bad drivers to, uh, you know, to have an accident. So whatever you know Serena has a kind of integrity I think I mean she she is what she is and uh, uh, that can be terrifying but uh, she certainly uh, uh, you know is able to go after what she wants let me I should shut up Julianne you had a question about uh, in the valley Yes, you may have <clears throat> already answered this, Ron, when you said uh, you didn't plan or want to do a sequel to uh, Serena, and I presume not to End the Valley either, but I was wondering if we might see Serena and Galloway in Brazil uh, destroying the rainforest, and if so, that would be a fitting uh, setting for their demise. I think uh, Galloway's mother prophesied they would die together and yeah. maybe uh, nature could finally have the last word. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I, that would be an interesting story. Uh, you know, I, 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 you know uh, yeah, it would. I, I'm just, I don't think I've got the energy to do it. I, when I wrote Serena, that, that book took me into the darkest place I've ever been as a writer. And uh, said that they could see a reaction physical physically i looked uh, you know it, it's a very dark book uh, now in the valley i think in, uh, is, is different but uh yeah there's an interesting story there and you know one of the little side lights is that uh at the end of serena when she's down there in brazil and it's it's not mentioned in in the valley but uh it is one of her business partners in Serena, uh, at the end, I mentioned that uh, in, 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 is, in Brazil is a, a connected to a West German tractor company. And it's actually, uh, that was where Joseph Mengele was uh -huh. that period. And Serena's business partner was Joseph Mengele. She was connected to him down there. I, I, that was kind of subtle in the novel. I just mentioned that she had, a, she was working with uh, people at West German tractor company, but there was the Mingle Tractor Company, and they were actually funding, funding, funneling money into Joseph Mingle during that period. I thought that would be kind of who would Serena end up with as a business partner, you know, if anybody. So yeah, that 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 would be uh yeah an interesting story. Uh whatever happened down there. Yeah. I, I think your readers would uh appreciate that and have a sense of justice and <laughs> Closure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe so. 
Yeah, well, the rainforest is being destroyed even as we speak. But yeah, right. Well, I don't, but Ron, I'm. I think Serena was about as dark a place as I've ever been as a reader. I don't know that I could go back. So I don't. <laughs> well, I, I understand. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Elta, you had a question about about in the valley, and then we'll finish up with Harriet's question. Is Elta here? Yeah, I'm sorry, my computer's messed up. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. All right, terrific. I'm on my iPad. Well, this has been an amazing hour. And I think, Ron, that you've already answered my question, which is about the ambiguity with which we are left with so many of these stories and, and also the incredible empathy that you show to these damaged, damaging, hurting characters I mean, my sense was that your empathy was such that we we empathize with them as well. And I, so I've been haunted by many of these characters. And what I've what I wondered was, and you've really said the answer is is whether you can if they continue to to live and their stories go on in your mind. I mean, uh, you know, I care. Stacy has just killed me that there she is at the end of that story and no place for her and. Um, do you, I think you've answered this, that yes, many of them do continue to live in your imagination. And um, do you plan to do more with any of the other story uh, characters in this wonderful collection? Well, that's, that's interesting because, I, you know, my, uh, I guess my second and third novels were either poems or short stories first. And then, uh, particularly with the, my third novel, The World Made Straight, I had about a 20 page short story about a character, young man, about 17 years old. And uh, at the end of the story, he actually is, uh, dies. And, I, and uh, I felt really bad about that, <laughs> you know, uh, because he'd just done a couple of, uh, you know, very immature uh, things. And I, I certainly did my share of those when I was 17 or 18. So. Uh, uh, I, you know, I brought him back to life and, and, and put him in a novel and he actually survives it. So yeah, sometimes these characters have unfinished business. And that's true of Ross, for instance. You know, I knew there was more to Ross and I, uh, so I went back to him. So there may be, you know, uh, it may be that uh, one of those characters uh, reemerges um, uh I, you know, I don't know, and 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 as I, as I say, and I, I I do not say this flippantly, but uh, it's kind of like the characters kind of let me know, you know, uh, they they will <laughs> nag me until I, I I start something, and it, it's funny where you know I I I've kind of had an image, uh, and at a, I don't like to use the word idea because it's not so much an idea, but uh, I, I I had a premise. I, I knew a, a kind of story I wanted to write about 10 years ago, and it, it was only last month I was able to write it. Wow. Character just kind of been hanging around in my head. And uh, uh, finally, for whatever reason, uh, about a month ago, I knew what he was going to do. And I knew why, or I thought I knew why. Uh, actually, I didn't. <laughs> But that's, you know, that's one of the great things about writing. Uh, Flannery O'Connor, when she wrote Good Country People, uh, if you know that story uh, where the, the wooden leg is stolen, she says that uh, she did not know the Bible salesman was going to steal that leg until that moment. Now, when you read that story, it just seems so structurally set up that you can't imagine that that was true. But I believe her uh, because I I, I had that same feeling. And I think that's one of the weird things, you know, the themes are very often there, uh, but I think they tend to start off organically. You know, I never, you know, I've never written a book where I said, okay, I'm gonna write about this particular environmental theme, or, you know, I'm going to write about uh, injustice. Uh, it, it, it kind of always begins with the characters. And uh, um, I think when I was, one of the lessons I've learned as a writer when I was young, I, I would always kind of think I had a plot. I knew exactly what was going to happen. That was the biggest mistake I, I could make. Um, 
you know, I think uh, I, writers, or at least I, I have to kind of just wonder and wait for the characters to come and, and be grateful when they do and, uh, and just kind of go off into that place. I guess I'm a Jungian. Uh, you uh, know, I always kind of want to believe the stories are out there and that the writer very often is just kind of like a, a radio tower. You know, occasionally, uh, you know, a story will come in on the wavelength and uh, and and you write it. But uh, uh, that's that's the fun part. Yeah. I wish I was on that tower. <laughs> I work well, on. you know, the scary thing is you never know if it's going to come again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you just you just kind of got to be ready if it does. But uh uh, yeah, it's, it's such a strange thing. Uh, Here's another question for you uh, about writing. Harriet, you want to pose this? It'll be our last question. Um, I, I kind of think you've already answered this too, but maybe I'll discover that I'm wrong. Um, uh, and it maybe this question really belonged back when we were talking about Serena as a character. But um, In the Valley uh, is built on a shifting point of view. Uh, but none of the sections enter Serena uh, and her point of view. Um, can you talk to them about the decision? Um, and um, uh, is it, was it a conscious decision? Was it, um, uh, what would have happened if we were in Serena um, uh, in, in, in her section? That is a wonderful question that I love answering. Because, <laughs> and, and because you'll understand exactly why I answer it this way. Uh, you know, one thing I think with a uh, an evil evil, I think it very often, you know, we we want to understand it, but it's much more frightening and disturbing when we don't, we can't. And and what I mean by that, for instance, uh, if I were to reveal Serena's, I, and that was very conscious on my part in in both in the valley and the Serena, and and let's say for instance, uh, she had been. Some, something terrible, I mean, she, you know, something terrible had happened when she was 18 years old. And, uh, and we could look at that and say, this is what caused her to be this way. Uh, we, she would lose that mysteriousness. Uh, and, and I think uh, to me, uh, the, the most interesting char evil characters in, in literature uh, are the ones where we can't quite pin down why they are this way. I, I think of a, uh, uh, you know, Iago uh, in Shakespeare. I mean, we, we have some ideas, but we never quite know. Um, I think of Shigur in No Country for Old Men. You know, we, we don't know quite why he's the way he is. Uh, and even Hannibal Lecter. Um, and, you know, I think one of the biggest mistakes Thomas Harris made, um, just my view, is when he explained why Hannibal was that way in his last book, Hannibal's much more interesting to me if I don't know why he's the way he is. So that's, I didn't want, I didn't want that easy explanation, you know, that uh, we could just say, okay, Serena uh, and evil is this way because of this, this one thing. So that, that, that's my hope that, uh, you know, I wanted to keep her mysterious that way. Yeah, it, keeps, it does keep her mythic. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and actually somebody once said, um, I, I can't remember who said this to me, he said that, uh, uh, the gods are above psychology. And I love that quote. And I kind of had that quote in the back of my mind with her because she almost is, you know, I think. Uh, uh, so, yeah, that was kind of, uh, yeah. And, uh, but I love, yeah, that's a, that's a good question because I think it, I, I talk to my students sometimes about that, uh, that you don't want to over explain certain characters. Uh, and I think that's a, you know, I think what Shakespeare probably, is, as well as any writer I know, there's always seems to be some missing element, even good characters um, that, you know, we don't quite understand. And, and I think that's, that's good because I think that's true to human beings because there are always aspects of ourselves that people, even the people that think they know us best, don't really know. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. And I think it exa works exactly that way. She is terrifying because of that. Partially, at least in good part, because of that. Yeah. Yeah, and well, you know what I love about wealthy, you know, some of the stories like the Wide Net and and, and Golden Out. I mean, she she's so good at using those archetypes, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I love that level, but 
as I said earlier, there's always that sense of these characters being individuals. Uh, you know, I think a good writer can can have it both ways. Yeah. Well, Ron, we want to thank you for being with us today and to tell you how much we appreciate your work, your stories, well, your novels, and your poems. Uh, well, let me just say in conclusion, I, I don't know if you remember this, uh, Suzanne, but I actually, when the Yodora Welty House was opened, I actually gave, I think, maybe one of the first readings there, uh, which was wonderful, uh -huh. you know, to be there and to be in her house and to uh, see where she worked. Uh, and uh, a good friend of mine from Jackson, Beth Henley, uh, you know, Beth was a uh -huh. friend of uh, Miss Yodora. And, yes. and so was her mother. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I hope to get back down because I love Lemuria. That's such a great book tour. And, you know, and I've come there, you know, when I've done book tours, I've always come to Lemuria and Square Books in Oxford. And uh, I hope we'll have a chance to go again and, and, and I'll be able to go to, is it the Mayflower? The uh -huh. Mayflower? We'll take you. We'll go to you the know, Mayflower. I love, yeah. I, I, well, I know that was one of her favorite places. And when I come to Jackson, I usually stay near there so I can walk down there and have a good meal. But thank you. I hope you enjoyed the book. I truly do. Oh, we loved it. And let me say that Eudora Welty was one of the most generous people I've ever known. She was generous with me personally. She spoke to my classes. She uh, uh, came and spoke to larger groups at my invitation. And I think you have that same spirit of generosity and I think that spirit of generosity is evident in all of her fiction and it's evident in all of yours. So thank you. And we are looking forward to having you back here for the Jolly Lecture, I hope. Oh, I, I hope we can do that. I really do want to come back to Jackson, love that town. So thank you all. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you so much. Bye.